Welcome everyone to the Black Book today. My name's Sam McKee, joined by Bob Hollywood Hayden. We welcome you to the 71st edition of the Standard Bread Horse Sales Company auction here at Harrisburg. The yearlings, the big theme as we kick off the action this season for 2009. And Holly, I think there are five themes we can focus on. And first would be the undefeated this year in horse racing. That's right, a horse racing first, harness racing and thoroughbred racing both have an undefeated horse of the year for the first time ever in the same season. Rachel Alexandra and maybe Zenyatta if she wins the Breeders' Cup and 12 for 12, Muscle Hill. Now, what we've seen here at Harrisburg over the past few years is trotter domination. Do you expect that to continue? It should be interesting. It probably will. The top six horses sold last year are all trotters. In the last 13 years, 11 times the sales topper was also a trotter. I think a lot of people say I'm doing some Hambletonian dreaming. And the other thing, when you flip through the catalog this year, it's the grand finale of a true super sire in our sport. That's Western Hanover. Last year we saw Arts Place's last crop, and Sports Writer came out of there. This year, Western Hanover, just nine days after winning his third and fourth unprecedented Breeders' Crown, he sent 67 yearlings out, and all told, counting his sons and grandsons, 229 yearlings are tied right back to Western Hanover. And you and I are big fans of pro football and the NFL, and I guess the spread formation offense kind of applies to the yearling sale as well. You better believe it. The last 17 horses of the year by 17 different sires last year of the top six horses sold four different sires. And finally, the big reason everybody is here at Harrisburg is the idea of dreaming big. Now, who isn't thinking Horse of the Year at Harrisburg in the yearling department here? Gallo Blue Chip, Bunny Lake, Rock and Roll Hanover, Donato Hanover, and Muscle Hill. That's five times the Horse of the Year has sold at Harrisburg as a yearling. We've caught up with some of the biggest names and players in the industry, some of the prime time subjects in our sport, and you're going to enjoy our conversations with them. So stay tuned and enjoy the Black Book today. The legend's part of the program right here. George Siegel is with me. And George, 2009, what kind of year has it been for yourself and Brittany Farms? It's been an unusual year. One, t uh, a couple of terrific horses and the rest just mediocre. Vintage Master and uh, Il Bellagio and then not much else. Well, you've had uh, a long and unbelievable run for a long time. What about the Glide Masters, the first crop? What do you think? I'm very excited. I uh, bought into a couple. Uh, I have a trotting filly that we kept at the farm and I'm looking to buy one here. I'm very excited about his future. You know, Cam Fella's last crop had his richest performer, Eternal Cam Nation. Arts Place's last crop had Sports Rider, right. maybe one of his greatest horses, we'll see. And now, Western Hanover's last crop sells here. You know better than anybody, you race both Arts Place and Western Hanover. What's, what's going through your mind when you see that? Uh, I think that the horse has just as good a chance now at the end of his career as he did during his career. I don't, I don't know it'll be a best performer, but he'll have good performers, and he may have a great performer. Would it be fair to say that Western Hanover, though a great racehorse himself, overachieved after his career? Absolutely. And his sons and grandsons have produced champions also. Yes, and 229 yearlings in this sale are sons or grandsons or Western Hanover himself. So a lot of, a big influence continues in this sale. Big, and du no Dukes is the ultimate influence because he, he's the sire of Western Hanover and he's had a big influence and he's overachieved as a sire and a sire of sires that he did on the racetrack. And I left out a name in that too, Life Signed and Life Signed with Real Desires and another couple of big names. Absolutely, but Arts Place and Western I think stick out right now. And what about the trotting end? Last year, the top six horses sold as yearlings were all trotters. 11 in the last 13 years, the number one priced horse was a trotter. Are people Hamiltonian dream in there? Absolutely. It's the biggest race in harness racing, a million and a half dollars. It's the best deal in terms of payments uh, on what I consider one of the two or three best racetracks in the United States. And uh, I think it's, it's a shot that uh, people want to take. Can you still get bargains on the fillies and mares at a sale like this? Because I know you've been concentrating on the broodmare band for a lot of years now. I think that the opportunities on pacing fillies and trotting fillies at a public auction now are tremendous. Uh, there's so many fillies sold in Lexington that were very well bred and good individuals for less than $75,000 and quite a few for less than $50,000 with excellent pedigrees. A lot Excellent. of, a lot of uh, horsemen, a lot of buyers are thinking now and today, 
you've had more of a long-term approach in the last 30, 40 years, and it's paid off well for you. Well, I started when I was 35, I'm 70 now. I don't know how long of a long-term approach I'm going to have from here, but you can't. You have to look a little further than tomorrow. Uh, I think that there's tremendous opportunities both in both sexes and both gates right now. And, and let me ask you about the four days of the yearling sale. What's your take on the three days going to four for yearlings? Well, I thought the three days was pretty long, and four makes it even longer. Uh, I'm only here for two, and uh, I'll leave the rest up to uh, everybody else. Are you here for the primetime players? Is that what you're saying to me? <laughs> I th well, you could get a good horse anywhere, and a great horse can come from any pedigree anywhere. But looking at the odds and looking at what's most likely, I believe the first two days are the most likely. So if you had one more place you'd want to visit in the winter circle, where would that be? Would that be the Breeders' Crown, North America, Meadowlands Pace, Hamiltonian? Always, always the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian's number or one. Or the Oaks, either one. That's the place you want to be. Right. George Siegel's been there before, and don't count. I'm not going back there again. George, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. If you're looking at catalogs here at Harrisburg, you might want to steal this man's. Mel Hartman is here, and um, Mel, first things first, how was your uh, Breeders' Crown Night this year, Woodbine? Uh, it was uh, it was terrific. It was uh, very exciting. Uh, it was very windy, very cool, but uh, Poof raced very, very well. I'm very proud of her. Poof, she's gone, but uh, Il Villaggio wasn't there. That was a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, it, it was in the elimination. Uh, I, uh, I was watching it at home, and, and I kind of just screamed, and my wife didn't know what was wrong, but I was very shocked that he made a break because it's very uncharacteristic of him. And uh, we sent him down to Kentucky to have him check from top to bottom. We found a few little things that would give reason for him to maybe go off stride. So we just want to get him better for next year and uh, have a lot, a lot of faith uh, in him. And hopefully he'll be my ticket to the Hamiltonian. I remember another uh, two-year-old Colt who made a break in his elimination back in 97 named Muscles Yankee and came back in 98 to rule the world and now he's ruling the siring world. So you never know, right? Well, let me tell you, from uh, from your mouth to God's ears would be a pleasure. <laughs> what about your catalog there? What's uh, You got mostly trotters or pacers? Uh, I'm basically down here uh, concentrating on uh, trotting fillies and uh, I've seen a few that I like very much and uh, I still have a lot of homework to do. Yeah, and I'm looking at, uh, I just mentioned before, Costa Rica's got over 800,000. She's not going to win her division because you are. Well, poof, she's gone. But there's a lot of money out there for the two-year-old trotting fillies. There's a tremendous amount of money and uh, you know you can do all the homework you want in the black book and uh, check them from top to bottom but you know what you have to be lucky and that's the key and uh, you know we've had a good year this year and uh, the challenge for me now is to, to find another poof so we're working on it and the mid-level guys got a shot last couple of years last year sports writer from arts places last crop went right. from 50 a year before Muscle Hill went for 50, so it puts a lot of people oh, yeah. in play. Absolutely, you got to do your homework, and uh, you got to. It's listen. I've been here since 8:30 this morning because it's not too busy, and that's why I like Sunday, and that's why I drive down on Saturday, and uh, you get a chance to look and, and probably see a little bit more than you can uh, when it gets busier on a Monday, Tuesday. You got to be patient as an owner. You got to be patient here at Harrisburg too. I would think. Well, there's a couple of things that, uh, as an owner that you really need. The patience is definitely one of them, and the other one's money. That's right. You know, so it's, uh, it, the, the business today is very, very expensive, so it's, you have to make some very hard decisions sometimes, but uh, you got to use your business head, that's it, and you got to keep to it. How are we going to separate us, all these top trotters going to Stan Stud? We have the first crop now, Glidemaster and Chocolatier. Donato Hanover was in 2007. Right. Do we cheat him and how? This year, Explosive Matter and Muscle Hill. There's going to be uh, a whole bunch of top trotters. Well, uh, that's why I uh, concentrate mainly on trotting fillies because these top trotters need good trotting fillies to breed to. And, uh, you know, to me, it's like uh, investing in real estate, uh, especially with a blue blood trotting filly. There's residual value. You protect your downside. You keep them insured when they're young. And uh, it's, it's an investment. But so, like any other investment, you have to be lucky. Like George Siegel had the right idea years ago. He wasn't thinking about today and tomorrow. He was thinking down the road with the broodmare band. Well, maybe that's why I've stolen some of George's ideas. <laughs> but Not a bad guy. Myself. Yeah. How about the uh, the four days of the yearling sale? Is, is the yearling sale now a place to get yourself a racehorse down the line? Is it easier to do it that way? Because it seems like it's tough to buy yourself a good racehorse. It's, it's very, very tough for the type of dollars that you're racing for now. And you look at all the different states. I understand Kentucky's on the verge of approving slots also. 
uh, it, it's those mixed sales. If you have a decent horse in the mixed sale, you're going to get paid royally for it, and you should, because they can make it back uh, within a few months. Uh, you know what the type of stakes we have. Uh, but again, to end up at that level, you have to have mares that get in full, that throw yearlings. The yearlings have to be developed into racehorses. So I'm at the beginning stage, and that's what I concentrate on. Hey, I just thought of something. Poof, she's gone, and Il Villaggio, you could be uh, uh, we, pretty prominent next year on Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian well, Oaks Day. You never know. We could, uh, we could be very prominent, and we could have a marriage made in heaven. Sounds good right there. Mel Hartman, so much. Uh, thanks a lot for stopping by. Thank you. There's a name you're going to be hearing a lot of this week, Blue Chip Farms. Mike Kimmerman from Blue Chip right here. What kind of week are we looking at here, Mike? Well, hopefully we're looking at a good week. You know, we spend uh, three years getting these things to the harvest, so we come down here, we hope they're, they're well received, and uh, I think uh, the climate's a little better than it was last year here. Uh, people certainly have gotten comfortable with the fact there's a lot of money to race for and, and that these horses uh, will be eligible for... Uh, you know, as much money as there's ever been to race for next year. A lot of farms, you know, they race for that in-state money, but Blue Chip Farms in New York, you're racing for money all over. Yeah, wherever you can find it. You turn over a rock, you're hoping that you're raising horses that, that can go get the money that pops up. And, uh, you know, our stallions uh, have been very competitive, uh, certainly in New York and, and, and outside on the Grand Circuit and, you know, even uh, Europe as well. Yeah, Credit Winners had a pretty big run last four or five years, hasn't he? He's done uh, real well, and uh, we've been real pleased with him again this year. And uh, you know, they they stick around. You know, you're starting to see some of them racing, even some you know in the overnight ranks. It's it's nice to see a horse that has you know good young horses and, and horses with some longevity as well. I see number two in the uh, North American standing is a horse called Better's Delight in earnings. So uh, every year he seems to pile on a little more. Yeah, and you know, the the book of, of mares that he, he got that'll sell this year is by far the best book of mares he's had since his first crop. So uh, we expect big things from him again. For those people who don't mind looking a little bit ahead, Shadow Play and Craze, a couple of stallions to look forward to? For sure. Uh, Craze had a, a great first uh, year at stud. Uh, his in-full rate was a, a ridiculous tick over 90%, which we've never had before in a freshman stallion. And uh, Shadow Play is getting settled in at the farm now. and. We'll have the information on his syndication coming out probably in the next couple of days. You know, when I'm thinking Blue Chip Farms, I can't help but think, well, most happy fella, on the road again. And you even raised Gallo Blue Chip, horse of the year in 2000. Yeah, no, Al Gallo, Gallo's an awesome horse, and Mark still has him in his place. I'm sure he's hoping to get him into the horse park someday. And, um, you know, the, um, the, the stallions that we've had, we try to, to price them starting out. You know, much like most happy fellow, we started him at a 3,500. It gives uh, everybody a chance to be involved, both at, uh, at the larger commercial breeders and even some of the smaller commercial breeders. And it, it served us well in, in, in getting good partnerships on those horses and, and giving them a real chance uh, to be successful. Does the four days of the yearling sale, uh, is there anything you have to alter, anything different from the breeders, the consigners' perspective? Well, there's always labor. You know, that costs something. and. Uh, you know, they reconfigured the sale a little bit, so we're all here, you know, till, till Saturday. But um, we'll bring down our, our Thursday horses. We won't bring in till Monday afternoon. Keeps us from having to bring in, you know, an extra bunch of people to ship all the way from home. And we'll have a little bit of overlap that way. But other than that, um, if the sale's good, it's not that big a deal. And if the sale's off, it seems like it's a month. Someone to blame it on, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how about uh, good horses? Uh, the last 17 horses of the year by 17 different sires, seems like they can come from just about anywhere. Uh, we create, you know, better and better horses every year, everybody. And, you know, uh, um, between the style of racing, yes, and, and the catch drivers and everything else, but, you know, the, the overall records, they drop a little bit here or there, and some of them stick around for a while. The amount of horses that can approach those times uh, seems to get more every year and you know I think that comes from what you're saying we're, we're breeding a, a lot of real nice horses there's some some really good programs we like to think New York is still uh, you know, at, at the top of that list but uh, people have a chance to make money in this business now and uh, we have to take advantage of that and, and promote it that way you know and uh, we hate to end on a sad note but one of the great things about racing is some of the foundation mares 
We just recently lost Treasure Blue Chip, 34 years old. What a good, solid, great story to read about there, isn't it? She, she was a, a great mare to have around. I have a picture of myself holding her when I'm 11 years old, and my brother standing next to me, he's 10. And uh, my kids have you know, helped take care of her the last couple years, and they're, they're 13 years old. So it's she had to stick around a long time you know, for that to happen. And, and it was really, really fun to have her around. And, and I know the kids appreciated her, too. Well, Mike Kimman, uh, looking forward to a really good sale. And uh, Blue Chip Farm is going to be a big part of that. Thank you very much. I guess you could say Murray Brown is the point guard for the entire sale here. Murray, four days of yearlings instead of three this year. Tell us about that. I like it a whole lot better. Uh, people were just getting worn out with the long sessions Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you know, not finishing till 8 o'clock, not getting a chance to relax, not being able to go, go to someplace nice for dinner and forget about the sale for the day. I, I, I think it's going to work out real well. Is getting a yearling also the way now to get yourself a good racehorse? The purses they go for, it seems like sometimes you have to be in from the ground floor to keep them. To some degree, it's the only way. You know, uh, racehorses have so much opportunity now. Uh, unless uh, unless you start from the ground up, if you want to buy a racehorse, you're going to have to pay dearly for it. Now, for the first time ever, uh, harness racing and thoroughbred racing can have an undefeated horse in both. Uh, Rachel Alexandra Zanyada and here at Muscle Hill. Isn't that why a lot of people come to a yearling sale and raise their hand? Sure. They're, they're buying dreams. You know, until next June, they have no idea what they've got. And mo most people who buy horses, whether they be yearlings, racehorses, whatever, they're optimists, they're dreamers, and they, you know, they're hoping that they get the next Muscle Hill or Donato Hanover or Dewey Cheatham and half. You know, Murray, about 30, 20, 25 years ago, we used to have Speedy Crown and Super Bowl for a long period of time dominate. Now, though, in the last four years, look what's happened in the trotting game. We had Chocolatier and Glidemaster come out the same year, Donato Hanover, Dewey Cheatham and Howe, Muscle Hill, and Explosive Matter. Major top trotters all coming out in a four-year span. Yeah, it's great. It's just wonderful. And uh, uh, nature has a way of taking care of things. You know, you, you think you're kind of in a funk and you don't know where the road is going to lead and all of a sudden you get a horse like Garland Lobel for example who rev revolutionizes the breed and uh, gives you know gives real access to other bloodlines. At an advanced age too. Yes, yes. Now Western Hanover uh, his last crop sells here at Harrisburg. You've been with him every step of the day. What's it feel like for you to watch the last crop going to the gavel? Well, it, it's an end of an era, but you know, it, it's just carrying forward his sons, grandsons, great grandsons. I think if we have harness racing a hundred years from now, we'll, we'll we'll still have the influence of Western Hanover. It's hard to win over two and a half million on the track and be an overachiever at stud, but Western Hanover's done that. Very much so. Very much so. Uh, uh, to be truthful with you, uh, Holly, the the expectations for him uh, within the breeding industry, except for ourselves, uh, George Siegel, and and all American standard breds, uh, nobody would buy a share of the horse. He standard, he stood at a fee of four thousand dollars for the most part, with the exception of of, of the three uh, market breeders mentioned beforehand. Uh, he got pretty much mom and pop mares and overcame every challenge he ever faced. Now the last 17 horses of the year by 17 different sires, can a good horse emerge from anywhere? Absolutely. It's happened throughout throughout history. So no one should be discouraged at any page in the catalog, you just never know. That that that's why you have the horses like the Sumac lads of the, the world, you the uh, big towners of the world. Uh, nobody thought these kind of horses could have a great influence, and they have. And Harrisburg's not a bad place to be if you're looking for horse of the year. Gallo Blue Chip sold here, then Bunny Lake, Rock and Roll Hanover, Donato Hanover, and Muscle Hill, the likely horse of the year also. I think 50,000 was a pretty uh, pretty nice tag. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, there, there are most definitely some great horses in this year's yearling catalog. The, the job is to find out which ones they are and to raise your hand at the right time. And there's plenty of money out there, especially for trotters. I mean, Costa Rica's got over 800000 this year, and she's not going to win her division. That kind of tells you right there that uh, you, can, you can make money right now. It's kind of amazing, yes. Murray Brown, the point guard for the entire sale. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Holly. 
We talked on the open about dreaming big here at Harrisburg at the yearling sale and a guy whose dreams were fulfilled is joining us now. That's trainer Greg Peck of Muscle Hill fame. And Greg, you must have to pinch yourself sometimes. Can you believe what has happened with this horse and the career he's had? You know, Sam, it is a dream come true as well as what's hard to believe. I, I said this the other day when I thought about it. There wasn't really a bump in the road. There wasn't a day when I said, oh, gee, he's not good today. He's not sound. He's sick. He's whatever. We're in trouble. I never had a day like that. And if you had asked me here at this sale this time last year, you know, is he going to have a year next year where he just coasts through 12 races, wins them all uneventfully, no problem, I would have said no. So I guess, as you said, Operation Hamiltonian complete its operation trotting colt, maybe best ever complete. It might be tougher to keep a two-year-old on Blemers than a three because of the gaps in their schedule. Tell us a little bit about the two-year-old season that Muscle Hill had. Yeah, well, he had gaps, and, and, and you raise a good point. Holiday Road, who went a very impressive mile, and the Peter Houghton didn't come out of it good, lost weight, and I brought him to Lexington, and I shouldn't have. I should have done what has been done in the past, is to shut them down after the Peter Houghton. But because of the success, Bob, of the... Muscle Hill situation last year, I thought I could emulate it, and I couldn't. Where it isn't easy to do with the gaps, but the other thing that you had last year is the Breeders' Crown was much later, so he got a couple of breaks at two. He had the break from the Peter Houghton to Lexington, and then from Lexington, you know, right till the end of November for the Breeders' Crown. So this year it, it, it was slightly different, but it looks like it probably is something that helped him last year. Perhaps the most stressful situation you had to deal with during the 2009 season was probably the World Trotting Derby, where your driver, Brian Sears, went up to Canada, didn't look like you were going to race. There was a time for an hour or two you thought you'd drive the horse yourself. Tell us a little bit about what happened that day. Well, what happened was, is if you saw the track, you thought, there is no way they're going to race today. And I remember, uh, especially Tim T. took went out and looked at the track, came back and said, no way. And he's from there. So I thought, you know, there's something to this. But literally, the I asked for the guy in charge who ran the fair, who's the general manager of the DeCoin State Fair, and they told me, and he looked at the track, and I said, I'd like for you to try it. And he said, will you race that horse? I said, I'll race the horse. He said, fire up the equipment. And it was just an unbelievable job that they did. But and as far as Brian leaving, I suggested that he probably have to leave. It did not look Good, that's for sure. It didn't look good because of the track conditions, so I really can't blame him for that. 20 straight wins to wind up his career. How important was it to keep that streak alive? Well, you know what? It was quite a streak to keep alive, and what was nice was to win the Breeders' Crown. As a matter of fact, Steve Elliott congratulated me down there today, and it was nice of him to say it felt good that, you know, because you could just see that probably something that he would have liked to have had and it didn't happen but again you know maybe it, that's another example of the race later in the year and, every, or, and all that stuff so that was nice to finish it arguably he was as good when he stopped as he was in June as he was in August as he was in September October in Lexington it was an amazing thing you'd have to see the shape and the overall mental demeanor that he had and everything he was ready to go the one disappointing thing about the season for me from a racing fan's point of view, Greg, you never had a shot to break 150 weatherwise. Probably Hamiltonian Day you could have done yep. it, but hey, that's a day you just want to win the biggest race in the sport. Lexington, the weather didn't cooperate. DuCoin, the weather obviously didn't cooperate. In your mind, perfect conditions, how much does the Colt try? Probably, I'm, I'm sure he would have tried it in 49. I mean, he could have done that Hamiltonian Day. I have no doubt in my mind and sometimes I wonder maybe he could have even shaved, shaded 49 I don't know but cer certainly 49 but Sam you know I must say there's nobody in the business that I know of who you know has a good read of the business that doesn't think that he could have easily beaten 150 so it's almost like he might as well have also I'll say this I don't ever recall and you know, I'm a student of the business I've read about it for years I I've watched it I'm three generations of it I don't think there's ever a cult trotter, really a horse uh, uh, of, of any gender of, of either gait that won as easily as he did time and time again. I guess you'd have to think about Niatros, 
you know, but he went over the, the rail that time, and then he hit hitting the bike, I think, in the, in the eliminations of the Wilson, or the Meadowlands Pace, I just forget which one, and, and he won that. But if you just think of, of all the other greats, at some point, when you think of Mac Lobel, how great he was, you, you know, at, at, at the wire in the Hamiltonian, he made a break because his feet were, he, he, you know, he had to be pushed. Where this horse, that never happened. It, it, he was never, ever turned loose, that's for sure. So it's a, I look at it in that light, I'd rather that he went out that way than somebody said, you know, because let's face it, there is nobody now that can suggest he had any vulnerability. It's not like they're saying, oh yeah, if so-and-so, this had happened, he would have beaten him. I have never heard that. You know, I, I heard in advance of races, people thought they might beat him, but once it was over, I never heard anybody say, you know, if, if the trip had worked or this or that, they would have beaten him. Well, one last topic that I'd like to get into. There are some people that say, well, you know, the crop wasn't that deep, but yeah. people forget Explosive Matter is a dual world champion. Well, and not he was only like that, five lengths behind you. Not only that, I think any other year, Explosive Matter would have been the best trotter. Now, that's my opinion. He's a very good trotter, as you say. You know, he was excellent, certainly, on the 5 8 he, he was great when he went in 155 at Dover last year as a two-year-old. You know, everybody thought, there's one coming out there. I think what happened to the crop, with respect, is they probably get tired chasing Muscle Hill. That's really what happened, because remember we talked in July, I'd be telling you guys, greatest crop ever, I could name so many that, you know, that were on the list that were really, really good. But as the year rolled on, I just think, and it kind of started in the handball when Muscle Hill just drove away from Explosive Matter and the others were just struggling behind at that point. It just seemed that that put you know, a damper on, on their careers for the rest of the year. The horse of a lifetime, Muscle Hill, his trainer Greg Peck, great job, congratulations. A familiar face that we always look forward to catching up with at Harrisburg every year is noted equine surgeon Dr. Patty Hogan who joins us now. And Patty, how is the new clinic going? I believe it's at Belmont Park and you opened it, what, two years ago? Actually, we opened this past May. It took a long time to build it, <laughs> almost seven years. But um, it's called Ruffian Equine Medical Center. It's actually it built on the grounds where Ruffian had previously been operated on, Dr. Reed's clinic. And it's uh, going great. It's a huge facility. Uh, it's about 27,000 square feet, and it's actually been really, really nice to be involved in it. I um, commute up there two days a week and work on the thoroughbreds there and then come back to New Jersey for my standard breads. Ruffian's uh, uh, accident on the racetrack happened in 75. Was there a facility then nearby for catastrophic injuries? Yes. Well, Ruffian was taken across the street to Dr. Reed's practice, which at the time was one of the few private practice hospitals in the area. And you know certainly they had the best people there to operate on her, but there certainly is a lot of that, you know a lot that we've learned since then, and we've come a long way as far as anesthesia, for instance, or even the techniques that would have been used to save her. Being involved with thoroughbreds as well as standard breds, there's a lot of similarities between the breeds, but there's a lot of differences too. And one thing at the yearling sales with the thoroughbreds, the radiographs are incredibly popular, and the trainers use those quite a bit. Whereas at the standard bred sales, you really don't see a whole lot of that. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I've done a lot of the repository work at the thoroughbred sale. That's the place where you go and read the films, and you know they're dealing with such high numbers as far as monetary value that. Um, that's one thing. It's worth it for them to have an x-ray, uh, you know, of everything on that horse's body. But also the kind of problems that they can run into are very significant as far as affecting their soundness, whereas a standard bred can plow through anything, you know, primarily. But um, they're a less, less of an economic risk, you know, to take. And also the problems that they encounter, they can usually go on with or require a simple procedure to remove. You know. Is the thoroughbred more brittle than the standard bred? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> I think there's some part of that that might be true, that they're, they're not, I, I don't think they're trained as well. I mean, that's definitely true, that the standard bread is far more conditioned to athletic, uh, you know, endeavors than the thoroughbred is. You know, when you think about what they do, 23 hours a day, they stand in the stall. And, uh, you know, the standard bread really gets a workout every day. But I do think there is a genetic issue. Every year here at Harrisburg, when Holly and I are reading pedigrees, there's a lot of horses' OCDs removed from the left hocks or both hocks or that sort of thing. What exactly, for the, for the new buyer, what does that mean, and does it affect the long-term prognosis of the horses for racing? That's a good question. If they ever find a cure for it, I think I'll be out of business. But um, OCDs are kind of like having a pebble in your shoe. It's like a, a little piece of bone that when the horse was growing up didn't quite form properly and became 
loose in the joint or loosely attached in the joint. And in, in almost every case, they have a good prognosis for removal, or in some cases, we can leave them in and they're still going to be fine. There's a few incidences or locations where they can actually be a problem, but it's really a, a congenital problem. They're, they're born with it, and it it's becomes apparent by the time they're a year of age. Well, most, most people like to, to get them so it's a star, or buy a horse becomes a star, but you've worked with stars, Smarty Jones, Fleet Alex, Mind That Bird. Uh, what, what, what's that been like? Well, it's always nice to work on a horse that has already accomplished so much. You know, you try to look at that animal and say, wow, what, what do they have that, you know, I'd like to see in a young horse and be able to project, you know, to find a champion. But I, I can tell you that one common denominator is they're extremely intelligent. They just have a presence about them. All the horses that really have accomplished a lot, you know, athletically. They, they seem to know they're a star. And so looking at them also, of course, they're, they almost always are impressive individuals, you know, conformationally, and, and they're built. You know, they're very, very nice looking, but they do all seem to carry themselves differently. Well, speaking of stars, your husband, trainer Eddie Lohmeyer, has a very nice pacing filly and indulge me, and her story is very interesting. They almost gave up on her as a yearling, and she's made, what, a half million dollars? Yeah, she's been just impressive, but most of that is on, on guts because she was turned back for an OCD problem, which is one of those incidences I was telling you about where it can make a difference. She had a cyst in each of her stifles, and you know the potential buyer was concerned about that, and rightly so. I mean, probably ha half of those horses will have um, a very significant problem with lameness related to those cysts. So the consigner was Bob Tucker, Eddie's longtime owner, and he graciously took the horse back and gave them a credit and said to Eddie, we'll try her. We don't know what she'll be like, and they didn't really stake her very much. But she just had so much ability. From the moment Eddie broke her, he said her gait was flawless. And she's sort of a, a small filly, too, which has helped her. But they do bother her. You know, they are, are sometimes a problem, and, you know, she's a little bit sore. Sometimes we have to manage her. But she goes out in the field a lot. She, she doesn't really jog as much as most horses do because he's trying to get, you know, some more mileage out of her. But she's game as could be. She's really, that's, that's most of it, you know, her heart. One last question for you, Patty. You do a lot of vet checks, I would guess, on yearlings here at Harrisburg in the standard root industry. What are the basic things that you look for? Well, you know, um, as far as veterinary-wise, I'm always looking for little bumps and, you know, telltale signs that maybe there's an issue with a joint or, you know, confirmation is very big for me now. I, I see horses that come into the clinic that have certain lameness problems and I notice there's a, a trend of, of a confirmational abnormality. So I am looking a lot at confirmation. But primarily, it's just really checking out joints or if there's been an injury, a, a laceration or some kind of injury to a tendon or things like that is, is really what I look at. But I'm like everybody else. I'm looking for things that, you know, should size up properly and, and you know, meet the eye and look at, like, a good confirmation prospect. Now, will you be buying anything for your own account here at Harrisburg I this week? I came out here saying I wouldn't buy anything, but it's really tempting when you walk into the arena. I'd really love to, but I'm, I'm trying not to. I have too many homebreds this year. Well, Patty Hogan, thanks so much for taking a few minutes to join us, and uh, best of luck.